Cheers to crossing the equator again. Still have a thousand miles to go to Suriname. Hey crew, just wanted to have a bit of a chat to you about what we do, I guess, or what I've striven to achieve, which has taken me a long time. Maybe I've been dreaming about going cruising around the world for 25 years. <laughs> so it, it's been a long process. I mean, I've been, I've had distractions. I had my career and everyone has their own thing, whether it's their family, um, perhaps young children going to school, um, a career or illness or anything is a distraction from what you want to ultimately achieve this dream of uh, going cruising around the world. I remember planning this for so long, reading so many books, every book I could get hold of um, about cruising. And I was pretty bewildered at one point for actually for a long time. I was like, how the hell am I going to be able to afford to do this? How can I stop work? How can I get the boat I need? What is the boat that I need? You go from your job, your family, normal life, car, house, dog, to living on a cruising boat and sailing around the world. How do you get there? I think I've identified there's four main things that you need to go cruising. There's possibly five. The fifth one, and it's not, I don't want to include it really, but, but it's your health. Um, whether you're physically able to handle a winch, pull down a sail. So that's, I mean, that's all, it's almost a given. So let's not talk about health because that's a given. You know, you're not going to even get in your car if you're not fit to do it. So um, let's forget about that. So there are four things that you need to make cruising your life. Money. Yes, of course you need money. Time. And that's a big one. You know, a lot of people have the money, but they don't have the time. The, the right boat. Now, when I say the right boat, all I mean is a seaworthy boat. The rest of it is up to you. Depends on how fast you want to go, how much you want to spend, what sort of level of luxury or comfort. Um, so they're all, those things don't matter. It's the actual seaworthy boat would be number three. And finally is simply the will to do it. It's quite a big mental step to untie the lines and let go of land and not come back. The will. So I'm going to talk about those four different aspects or those four key things that you need to go cruising full time. Hey guys, so I think I promised you that uh, we were going to talk about the four key areas that you need to go cruising full time. So the first one I mentioned was money. So what about money? How much do you need? How much to buy the boat? Let's talk about that in the boat section. But start with how much do you need on a, a yearly basis to cruise the world? So when we started cruising two and a bit years ago, we left with the intention of it being one year and then we would go back to work. All I had was my savings uh, in the bank. I have uh, no investments, just some cash in the bank 
and then I would go back to work after a year and think about the future. Of course, COVID hits. Can't go back to work. There is no work for my sort of work. We just keep going. So we've been two and a bit years now, uh, and it seems that we have spent about 50000 a year. Now that's a lot, $1,000 a week. But a lot of the expense has actually been this YouTube channel, which, you know, ultimately, hopefully, sometime down the road will make us a little money. That's our goal, anyway. Um, so I... I don't think ours is a good example of what it costs to cruise because, as I say, it's been, I'd say, at least half spent on YouTube channel. Camera gear, drones, computers, data. Data costs a lot of money in um, some places, you know, the Caribbean. What it costs you depends on what vessel you've chosen, what state of repair it's in, and the gear on board and how likely it is to break down and you need to repair it. So we'll talk about vessel choice in number three. Let's just talk about ongoing costs and the extremes of that. As I say, if you'd chosen a a floating apartment, you know, perhaps a condo cat or, you know, something with all the bells and whistles, then maybe your maintenance will be higher. You have to repair those things You don't want the value of the boat to drop, so you keep that stuff uh, in a good state of repair. Could cost you a lot of money. Compared to a friend of ours, which uh, we met him in uh, Padang, Sumatra, Indonesia. He's from Texas on a 28-foot mono. I haven't asked him, uh, but I would guess his boat cost him 20 grand, maybe less, probably less. And I would be guessing his yearly budget would be around 20 grand. 20 grand? What's that, 400 a week? That's a lot of beer and food in a lot of the parts of the world. You know, Asia, Africa, that's a lot of beer and food, 400 bucks a week. Um, and his maintenance cost would be pretty low for on a small boat. You can do most things uh, yourself, obviously. On a small boat, you've got a lot less to fix. So these are probably the extremes with regard to the cost of upkeep. Another extreme cost saving that you can make is if you DIY your maintenance. We do as much as we possibly can on Jupiter. and The only time I've hired, the last time I've hired a guy to do uh, work on Jupiter was uh, some welding because I didn't have any welding gear. Um, And to go out and buy the gear and then learn how to weld uh, the aluminium, which is a bit demanding. You know, you need a lot of practice. It just didn't make sense cost-wise. So we hired a guy in Richards Bay in South Africa and he did some welding for us and, and it turned out good. Otherwise, DIY everything. Do it yourself. You know, I mean, when you look at wages that I've noticed in boat yards, um, you know, it can be somewhere between 50 and 100 US dollars an hour. That's just not within my budget. So I do everything myself. I'm sure a job will come along which I can't do and I have to hire some professional um, but you know what, I've been burnt in the early days, probably, what was this, 20 years ago, I've been burnt by hiring professionals. There's a lot of professionals in boating, in yachting, and, you know, a lot of guys that don't know what they're doing, but they tell you that they know what they're doing, and they stuff it up, cost you more, or they rip you off in some way, don't do a good job. Um, so that's why I originally got into doing everything myself because if you're going to f*** it up, you might as well f*** it up yourself and learn from it and then, you know, you can do it next time. Another choice that is yours to make about how much it costs to go cruising is marinas. We don't do them. We have done marinas only when absolutely necessary. 
and, and one was Cape Town, South Africa, because the weather was so severe um, that you don't want to be on the hook with the wind changing constantly. And we had gusts, we had constant 40 knots for days, and we had gusts up to 70 knots. Uh, just in the time we were there. So uh, we were thankful to be in a marina. That was the last time we were in a marina for any length of time. We, we stop now and again in a marina, but mostly the purpose is to pick up packages so that we s send shipping uh, packages, parcels, shopping to the marina. And then, of course, you've got to stay one night just so you can pick up your package. The rest of the time we're on the hook and that's a extreme cost saving the cost of jupiter in a marina is well a catamaran is typically two times the cost of a monohull because you're taking up two spaces and that's even if you're on an end berth they charge you that you know an end berth is you know doesn't matter how wide you are but typically a hundred to 150 dollars a night so we don't do marinas when we can have only when absolutely necessary. So I would hazard a guess to say it costs you between twenty and fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, there's obviously no roof to it. There's no ceiling. Let's say. Let, let me rephrase this. It'll ch it'll cost you from about twenty thousand dollars upwards, depending on your choices. Can you make money on the way. Now I thought about this long and hard, how I could make money on the way. You can make a little bit here and there if you've got some skills. And if you're a DIY guy, you got some skills. You can offer those skills to other cruisers. And I've found it's about half and half. Uh, there's half and half DIYers and get a serviceman for everything is there's at least i'd say 50 percent of people um, i'm just ballparking here but there are probably 50 percent of people don't do any repairs they pay someone to do it it could be as simple as scrubbing the bottom anti fails a bit you know blah need someone to scrub the bottom we've got friends that hired and pay 300 US dollars to scrub the bottom of their boat. And why don't you just do it yourself? $300 is a lot of money for us. So I would have charged 250. Could have got 250 bucks in an afternoon's work. It could be, you know, fixing things. It could be trading things. Ideally, I sort of think, and if you had some sort of online business, that would be ideal. I don't really have anything like that, um, but we're sort of working on it with the YouTube thing. You know, maybe one day it will cover the costs of the camera gear and drones and computers that we need to buy. One day we'll make some money from that. Um, always a challenge to keep good internet coverage though, you know, when you're sailing. Um, and it's expensive too, you know, you can pay a lot of money for data in different countries. Some places it's cheap but uh, some is not. We also sold flags. Before we left China, we bought up about 400 cheap screen printed national flags, which were relevant to the countries we were visiting. So we had uh, across the Indone uh, Indian Ocean, we had uh, flags for Africa, for um, Caribbean, and we got some oh, Mediterranean. We haven't gone there yet, but we got a lot of flags for them and uh, across the Pacific. So uh, China was a good place to buy them cheaply and we got a bunch and we've been selling them at $5 each, you know. You don't want to pay 20 bucks for a flag when you're only visiting that country for a week, you know, so I thought there was a demand for cheap flags. Hasn't helped us much, but it's probably covered the cost of our flags. So we're happy with that. So let's cover the two main questions, I guess, is uh, how much do you need to go cruising? And can you make money on the way? Hey, 
Welcome to this week's Sundowners. So what we're doing with the Sundowners segment is going through a list of four key areas that you need to sort out in order to go cruising and, you know, if possible, indefinitely. So uh, last week we spoke about money. This week we're going to talk about time. So I'll tell you a little bit about my background. Um, this stint on Jupiter 2 for the last two and a half years is the first time that I've cruised indefinitely in my life. Prior to that, I had my career building and um, I could only go sailing initially on weekends, on days off. Um, my last job, I had uh, a roster of six weeks on, three weeks off. So that three weeks gave me a real taste of being able to say that I'm going cruising around Southeast Asia. And it, it was great uh, to have three weeks off at a time. But all it did was whet my appetite for more, you know. So I can tell you that sailing on short periods of time, uh, I can remember sailing out of North Queensland and out of Townsville down to the Whit Sundays, which is about, oh, I can't remember now, 200 mile, 300 mile. And I only had one week off to go down there, enjoy it, and come back. And uh, it ended up forcing me to sail when the weather was not suitable. It was horrible, actually. It was on the nose and gusting 35. And I was in a crappy old ferro-cement mono, which was... Uh, it was my second keel boat and it just didn't sail very well it was too heavy the the sails were too tired and um, it was a terrible trip motor sailing for uh, 43 hours non-stop no sleep it was horrible enjoyed the wet sundays and, and and ended up having a nice sail back but sailing on a schedule sucks seriously does and i know you know, I, I'm a realist. I know that most of us, that's all we can do. But let me tell you the amazing feeling of sailing without a schedule. Sailing when the weather is right. It is a complete change and just so much more relaxing. It is way better. Way, way better. So that's what I... You know, I want to help you guys achieve to strive to get these four key areas in order so that you can do that. So if you were just to have some time off work to go sailing, how long would you need to get a real good taste of it? I would recommend four months. I know that's a long time to ask your boss, can I get four months off work? But Four months will give you a good taste of the Caribbean, if you're coming from the States. It'll give you a good taste of the Med, if you're coming from Europe. And it'll give you a good taste of Southeast Asia, if you're coming from Australia or New Zealand. So four months is the sort of a nice time frame to aim for, to get a real taste of cruising without a schedule. So, let's now talk about timing in your life of when you can go sailing. Now, hang on a minute. Ah, this is obviously not going to be a simple subject and it's gonna be different for everyone and I don't have the solution, only you do. Um, things, there'll always be obstacles in the way of you going sailing full time, always. And that brings us to the end subject of having the will to make it happen. You're going to have, oh, the kid's got to finish school. The kid's got to finish uni. Oh, when I retire. Oh, when I've got enough money. Oh, when my wife's happy on the boat. She's not very comfortable. There's everything. We'll be trying to hold you back from untying the lines. So that's when it comes down to your will. And how important is it? That's only up for you to decide. I can't decide that for you, but it's not an easy change. 
it is a complete lifestyle change. So you have to work out your own timing. But all I can offer is perhaps the, the way I've always thought about it, um, even since age 30. I was always of the opinion that I may die tomorrow. So get it done now. Get it done. Because if you wait, you may be too late. Cheers. Ah, cheers guys. Welcome to this installment of Sundowners. So we've been talking about uh, the areas that you need to address to get in order to go cruising, yeah? So, the first one was money. The second one we talked about time. This week we're going to talk about the boat. The seaworthy vessel. Now, when choosing a vessel, there aren't that many requirements. Size is not that important. I'll always remember and be inspired by uh, an Aussie who built an aluminium, yes, <laughs> aluminium, 12 foot monohull, which he sailed around the world. He built the boat himself, sailed it around the world, and um, perhaps he still holds a record. His name is uh, Sergi Testa, and his boat was called Acroc Australis. And it's, it's in the Brisbane Museum, and just made me realize if you have a seaworthy boat size is not relevant only for comfort so let's try and break this down uh, I do tend to ramble on and I'm going to try and keep things succinct <laughs> and timely. Let's break this down into three areas. Critical requirements, important requirements, and nice to have requirements. So I want to refer you to some videos that I made or back uh, a year or so ago called the Ocean Crossing Checklist. In those videos I refer to two golden rules. Number one golden rule for successful and safe cruising is keep the water on the outside. This one is relevant to a seaworthy boat. Obviously we do our best to stop new holes being made in a boat. We don't want to hit things that's going to make a hole. We don't want to hit rocks, reefs, logs, containers, other boats. We don't want to hit anything. But that's got nothing to do with the initial seaworthy boat. That's just our seamanship. So, let's talk about the holes that are already in your boat. The hatches, companionways, doorways, windows, vents, seacocks and through hulls, and prop shaft seals. These are potential areas for water to come into your boat. Some of them much more volume of water than others, such as windows or uh, the companionway. Just make sure everything seals and you can follow the golden rule. Keep the water on the outside. Let's say we can't follow that rule. For some reason, we are unable to keep the water on the outside. Seaworthy boat will have ways of removing that water, bilge pumps. A bucket, sponges, um, bilge alarms. Also, if you happen to hold the hull at sea or lose a hatch at sea, break a port light at sea, you need to have thought of some measure to stop the water coming in. Whether it's a big piece of a plywood and some sort of uh, through bolt and a brace to 
fill and cover a hatchway or whether it's uh, an old sail, small head sail, storm sail that you can rig quickly underneath your boat to prevent water coming in a hole in the bow. But these are not prerequisites for the boat itself. This is your preparation for going to sea. All right, let's get on to important requirements. Important requirements, not so critical, but important. That is a reliable engine, some spare parts, a reliable and strong rig. You don't want that thing coming down on your first blow and hitting your boat, putting a hole in it. You want to be able to rely on your rig, steering and backup steering. Make sure they are in order. To stop being blown up onto a lee shore, you want some good ground tackle, a good anchor, good chain, or at least nylon road. Make sure that you have that gear in order. And of course, some way of navigating. Whether you choose to use a paper chart and a compass like they used to, or you want uh, some more modern electronic gear. Important stuff to have for a seaworthy sailboat. So finally, let's talk about the nice to have requirements. I think I, I'm going to summarize that by saying redundancy. Have redundant gear for your critical and your important requirements. Have another one in case it breaks. To explain better, check out this video, which is essential tips for successful cruising. So hopefully that gives you some idea of what to look for in a seaworthy vessel and how to prepare it for sea. Hi guys, we're talking about a list of four things that you need to get in order to be able to go cruising. First week we talked about money, second week we talked about time, last week we talked about the boat, this week we're going to talk about the will to go cruising. But I'm thirsty. Uh, all right. Most folks have a desire, a want, an ambition, a dream. Dreams are good. Dreams make you happy when you think of them. But they can also make you sad, frustrated, depressed, when you don't have your dream in hand. So, what about goals? What's the difference between a dream and a goal? Let me tell you. A decision with a deadline, a time frame, a decision. In order to go cruising, you have to make the decision that you will go cruising. I think I read um, somewhere years ago about goal setting and a survey was done if you were to write down your goal the statistics say it's about a 30 percent more chance that you will achieve that goal if you tell somebody you have a 50 percent more chance of achieving that goal now these stats i'm not positive on that's just a ballpark okay it's the gist of the survey if you are to tell everybody, tell the world your goal, you are 70% more likely to achieve that goal. So once you've made that decision, tell everybody, tell the world. You can now, we've got Facebook. Tell the world. Let everyone know your goal. To actually untie the lines, 
to quit job go sailing tm you need to set the goal make the decision with a timeline with a deadline you might have heard the saying good things come to those who wait it's bullshit doesn't happen doesn't work you need to be taking once your decision is made you've set your timeline you have to be working every day closer to the goal of cruising whether it be researching equipment uh, looking at boats for sale destinations looking at pilot charts planning you at the time of year you're going to cruise watching life on Jupiter just for inspiration you need to be taking steps every single day to get to that goal otherwise it's not going to happen so perhaps I'm oversimplifying this but it really isn't that hard it's make the decision set the date do the work every day to get to your goal cheers oh by the way this process works for anything in life that you might want <laughs>